All right, Exodus chapter 14, if you'll turn your, uh, last time I looked, Exodus was in the Old Testament, all right? So Exodus chapter 14, uh, we're going to just read excerpts from it, so I'm going to be skipping around a little bit. But it says in verse 10 that when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lift their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Verse 13, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. I still have an echo. That, do you hear the echo? Am I echoing or is it me? Okay. I was hoping it wasn't my empty head, all right? And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more forever. And the Lord will fight for you and shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hands over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hands over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong eastern wind all night, and made the sea into dry land, and the water were the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went out into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. Verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the, when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeting into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the water returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the armies of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left, and the Lord saved Israel that day. Out of the hands of the Egyptians, and the Lord and Israel saw the Egyptians die on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great works which the Lord has done in Egypt, so the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to you today, God, we enter into your courts with praise and thanksgiving. We do believe. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And we believe that he's coming again. And Lord God, we thank you for those uh, foundational beliefs that make life worth living. And Lord, that we, whatever we face, we know that our Lord lives. And that he ever liveth to make intercessions for us. Lord, we know that you're praying for us. You're our advocate at the right hand of the Father. And Lord, you're praying for each and every one of us today. And I pray, Father, that you will hear our Savior's prayer. And Lord, that as we stand before the seas of life, as we go through those bottom places of life, that we can go in and through those oceans that we will face with confidence and assurance that we're going to get on the other side and you're going to take us from the bottom places to the high ground places of praise and victory. God, help us to learn to be steadfast even in the bottom places of life. In the name of Jesus, we pray and amen. Today, I want to talk to you about staying in faith when you are at the bottom of an ocean. If you were here about 11 years or 12 years ago when I gave my trial sermon, I preached a sermon on storm survival. I talked about how that you don't have to sink or perish in the storm. I talked about how to walk on the waters when facing those winds of adversity. I taught you about how that the waves that are over your head are already under the feet of Jesus. I've given you some victorious sermons to encourage you as you walk through the storms of life. But what about when we are at rock bottom? Today I want to challenge you to stay confident in the Lord. Not only when you're facing those stormy seas of life, but even when you're at the bottom 
of an ocean. I want to talk about how to stay in faith when you have hit the rock bottom places of your life. So get out your outlines. Here we go. We're going to look at how to stay in faith when you're at the bottom of an ocean. First thing I want you to see is because you're in an unfavorable situation doesn't mean that we don't have God's favor in that situation. You know, when you and I face the difficulties of life, I want you to know that the favor of God is a driving force in the midst of your storm. And it is going to uh, hold back the forces of darkness that are trying to overtake you. You know, if it wasn't for the favor of God in your life, guess what? You wouldn't have survived that situation that you are, were in. Amen? If it wasn't for God's sustaining grace and supernatural enablement, whether seen or unseen, you would have crumbled under that circumstance. Do you know the one reason that you didn't have a breakdown when you hit rock bottom? Because God gave you a spiritual breakthrough when you were there. And if you're a child of God, I want you to know that God's favor is upon you. You know, we, we don't always think about God's favor. You know, we've heard that God doesn't have favorites. Well, he may not have favorites, but he ha does have people that follow closer to him as more than some of the rest of us. Amen? And I want you to know that the Bible says you can have the favor of God upon your life. Matter of fact, in Psalms 512, it says this, that the favor of God surrounds me like a shield. You know something about the favor of God? It doesn't come and go. Aren't you glad about that? People's favor toward you may come and go like the wind, but God's favor is with you not only in the good times, but also in the tough times. And one of the primary examples that I want us to see is this story of how that Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt to the very Red Sea, and they crossed on the bottom of that sea on dry ground. Remember when they arrived there at the scene of the Red Sea? The Bible tells us that Pharaoh had just let them go. But guess what? Men always change their mind, don't they? And so this Pharaoh changed his mind. And he decided that he would, and his armies and his chariot fleets were going to be in hot pursuit of Israel to recapture them. When the Israelites came to uh, this magnificent sea called the Red Sea, they were at a dead end. They were at an impasse. When they looked in front of them, they saw this deep blue sea, but they knew in back of them was the chariot fleets of Pharaoh in hot pursuit of them. Uh, so what happened at this impasse? You know, aren't you glad that God majors in the miraculous and specializes in the supernatural? God told Moses to take his rod, his staff, and hold it over and stretch out his hands. And guess what? That sea divided. An eastern wind began to blow a great chasm. And all of a sudden, there were two uh, colossal walls of water that rose up. And Israel, those two million people, passed through a bottom sea, but on dry ground. Isn't that amazing? Amen. You see... If you're a child of God, you've got the favor of God on you, regardless of what is facing you. You know, we can read this and we can see it. It's so obvious that the supernatural favor of God is upon these people. But I think you would have probably felt a little bit different if you were there. If you're right there when it was happening. Can you imagine looking at these colossal walls of water, thinking at any moment they could collapse on you? What would you be doing? You'd be holding your loved ones and your children. You would be wondering about that chariot fleet that's in hot pursuit of you. You see, it was not a place of calmness. I believe it was loud. I believe there was a lot of commotion going on. I believe that there was a lot of panic stricken people there. I don't think the children of Israel walked through the bottom of that Red Sea calm, cool, and collect. I believe that they were thinking about all the things that could happen. What if these colossal walls collapsed? What if we don't make it through in time? What if the pursuing Egyptian chariot fleet overtakes us? I can imagine they had a thousand and one things that they were worried about that could happen. Think about you going through this massive place. 
seeing these colossal walls of water. Wouldn't you have some fear, some worry, some concern? It wasn't until they got to the other side that they were on high ground, that the water subsided, that they began to rejoice in the Lord. What am I trying to tell you? You see, these people had the favor of God on them, and they could not see it. It was the favor of God that was holding back those colossal walls of water. It was the favor of God that kept those walls from collapsing and crushing down upon them. It was the favor of God that kept those Egyptians at bay so they would not defeat them. It was the favor of God that was taking them from the bottom of an ocean to the high ground of praise. Do you understand what I'm saying? Most of us, when we face those times of difficulties, those low moments of our lives, we fail to realize or comprehend that the favor of God is upon us. As we're passing through our bottom places in life, we tend to be thinking about all the things that could happen. Uh, we, we could be worried or, or, feel, uh, or fearful or, or full of anxiety or trepidation or have a hesitation or reservation about even making a step forward, not knowing what the future holds. But no, you and I as believers need to realize that we have the favor of God on us. Whether we're in a stormy sea on top of it or whether we're in the bottom of an ocean, God has and is holding back the forces of darkness for us. Think about that. God's not going to allow that, that sickness, that trouble, that addiction, that trouble in your job, that adversity in your life to keep you from his God-given purpose. Aren't you glad whom God has got, called that he will not only provide for but protect? You see... When God's called you to do something, when God has a plan and purpose in your life, nothing can foil that plan or purpose. Aren't you glad that the Bible says that the calls of God are irrevocable? In other words, they cannot be unbroken. I should have got a hearty amen for that. See, God's favor is like a force, and it's greater than the forces that are trying to push us down in the storms of life, or greater than those walls that look like they're going to come crashing down upon us in the bottom places of life. So I want you to know that if you're in an unfavorable situation, that doesn't mean that we don't have the favor of God in that situation. Number two, write this down. Here we come to the second point. There is an unfathomable, impossible to measure force of God that will show up in our favor. See, this divine favor of God is like a divine force in the midst of our storms that is holding back the forces of darkness that are trying to stop us. When you and I look around, what do we see? We see those colossal walls of impossibilities, improbabilities, oppositions or obstacles we see those problems, we see those troubles, we see those addictions, we see those troubles and trials and tribulations, and they can be quite frightening to us. But you and I as believers must come to the realization that God's favor is with us. Aren't you glad that God's favor goes with you wherever life takes you? Aren't you glad that God's favor goes with you whatever you are facing in life? And like the children of Israel, you're going to have the favor of God upon you no matter what you face. You see, the adversities, the adversaries, aren't you glad they don't have the final word over your life? Who has the final word? The almighty God of the universe. Amen? And my friends, what God has started in you, the Bible says he will bring to completion. The Bible says the good work that God has started in you, he will bring to its completion, its ultimate fulfillment. The plan and purpose that God has for you will come to pass. Why? Because God is in supreme control of it all. Yes, instead of being frustrated about the problems we face and, and, and worried uh, about 
what is happening or what can happen or upset about some kind of setback or, or bad break or closed door. What we ought to do is turn that around and we ought to say, thank you, God, that your favor is upon me. Thank you, God, that your favor surrounds me in the midst of the storm. Thank you, God, that your favor is holding back these colossal walls of opposition. Thank you, God, that these walls are not going to collapse and come crushing down upon me. Thank you, God, that you're bringing me from the bottom places to the mountaintops of praise and victory. My friends, we have the tendency to think that we only have the favor of God when things are going well. But let me let you know a little secret. You have the favor of God even in the traumatic places of your life. What I want you to know, to know is that you have the favor of God even when you're between two walls that look like they're going to cave in on you. You have the favor of God no matter how in hot pursuit those enemies may be running toward you. The most amazing thing about it all is sometimes you and I get so focused on those things that are coming against us, those threats, those things that could happen, that we fail to realize that it's because of the goodness of God that we are still standing where we are at today. I love Psalms, don't you? I'm working on a series of sermons through the book of Psalms. And one of my favorite verses is found in Psalms 27, verse 13. David said, I would have fainted in the land of the living if I had not had hope of seeing the goodness of God. See, if you could see behind the scenes, you know what you would see right now? You'd see God holding back those colossal walls of opposition. You would see God making that crooked way straight. You would see God smoothing out the rough edges. You would see God filling up the valleys and lowering the mountains. You would see God making a way where there is no way. You would see God in the process of taking you from the bottom places to the mountaintops of praise. You and I need to realize that God's unfathomable. That means beyond measurable force is working behind the scenes. Aren't you glad for that? You see, those enemies may have knocked you down, but guess what? They can't knock you out. You may see an adversary or you may see an adversity coming your way. You need to quote Deuteronomy 28, 7. You need to read Deuteronomy 28 when you go home. What a blessing. God gives his people all kinds of promises. And this is the promise he says that we're to claim in verse 7. He says, your enemy will come against you one way, but I will defeat them, and they will flee in seven different directions. <laughs> My friends, you don't have to live in worry or fear or anxiety or wondering how things are going to work out. You have a secret. And what is your secret? You're the child of the Most High God, and His favor surrounds you like a shield. You know something about God? God fights the battles for you. Have you ever seen me fight one battle here? You may have seen me take a lot of insults, a lot of accusations and insinuations, but you have never heard me publicly fight a battle. Why? Because the battle is the Lord's, it's not mine. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says they may have meant it to harm, but God is going to turn it around in your favor and to your advantage. The Bible says, for all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. The Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the enemy is going to work overtime trying to get you all worried, trying to get you all frustrated, trying to get you all panicky, trying to get you so overwhelmed by your problems that you don't believe anything good is going to come out of it. But what's going to happen is God's favor and God's unfaithfulness force is going to show up and it's going to turn things around on your behalf and it's going to bring you to a new level of spiritual growth and development and productivity and victory that force of God that favor of God is going to overcome those oppositions and obstacles that you thought was going to be the end of you and guess what it's only the beginning of a new adventure in the Lord no wonder the Bible says they that know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. Amen? We see such an amazing story here. The favor of God, I want you to know, is not going to keep you from the storm. 
But the favor of God will get you out of the storm. Amen. Here's the third thing I want you to see. We must understand, we may not understand why we have to hit rock bottom of life. But it's there, underline that phrase, but it's there that God breaks the forces that are trying to enslave you. You know, we may not understand everything that happened. Life is not fair. How many of you have ever, taught, well, ever been taught life is fair? You know, I hear people all the time saying, that's not fair. Well, you should know it's not fair. Life is not fair. You know, things are going to happen that you don't understand, but you've got to trust God knows what he is doing. And remember when they came to the Red Sea before the Red Sea parted? Remember what the children of Israel thought? Now, you would have thought they would have been full of, of thrill and excitement of faith. They had seen the ten plagues, amen? They had seen all the miracles that God performed in Egypt. You would have thought they'd have been more confident when they came to this impasse. But when they were at the Red Sea, before it parted, they basically said, God, why'd you bring us out here? You've delivered us from Egypt. You freed us from bondage. You promised us a promised land. And now we're at an impasse. We're at a dead end. There's a deep blue sea in front of us, and there's the proceeding or pursuing Egyptian chariot fleet behind us. It looks like they're going to recapture us and take us back as slaves. God, I don't understand. You and I would have probably felt the same way. Amen? We're not any different than the children of Israel. We may be a little bit sophisticated, but not much. We sure need to learn their lessons. Yes? God's ways are not always our ways, are they? God's thoughts are not always our thoughts. But as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways higher than your ways. And God's thoughts are higher than your thoughts. We see that the Red Sea opens up. And the children of Israel go on dry ground through that passage, that chasm of between those two colossal walls of water. And that, then the Egyptian chariot fleet begins to go through that chasm. The armies of Pharaoh go through that chasm. It looks like it's going to hold up for them, but what does God do? He takes his hands down. And those walls collapse and close in on them, and they are drowned. And the Bible says that their bodies are washing up upon the seashore. You see, sometimes God will take us through some difficulties to get rid of things that are chasing us down to enslave us. You know that storm of life you're going through? You know that sea bottom you're at? You know that fiery furnace that threatens to consume you? You're going to make it through as a child of God. I want you to know that. You're going to make it through. But those things you do not need, those people and places and things that are hindering you, that addiction, that dysfunctional personality, or maybe that toxic relationship you have, they're not going to make it through. Do you understand what I'm saying? If the enemies of Israel would not have drowned in the Red Sea, then the Israelites would have always been watching over their shoulders. They would have always wondered when Pharaoh was going to show up and recapture them and reclaim them as slaves. Yes, it must have been nerve-wracking going through that chasm of the Red Sea. They didn't like it. It was loud. A lot of commotion. They were panicking. Wondering if it would not collapse upon them. But let me tell you something. When you go through those times that are loud and full of commotion and you're about ready to panic, I want you to know that God has got you there in that place and he has your best interest at heart. You may not like the difficulty you're going through. It may not look fair. It may look like you're at the bottom. But I'm here to tell you, when you come out of that, you're going to come out free from the things and the people and the places that have tried to hold you back all your life. Remember in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, what God said to the children of Israel? He said, look at these Egyptians that are coming after you. Take a good look at them. Because... Those enemies you will see no more. When you go through the storms of life, 
the sea bottoms of life, the fiery furnaces of life. What is God doing? He's burning out the dross, the impurities in your heart. He's getting rid of those things that are holding you back. And if you will stay in faith and be faithful to where God has placed you, those things that are trying to stop you will be temporary. You know why? Because you're in the palm of the almighty God's hands. Amen. Amen. You're in the palm of his hands. He would not send you in that storm alone. God is right there with you. And your enemies will not stop you. They cannot take you down. Why? Because God has a divine hedge of protection around you. Why don't you think David wouldn't kill King Saul? You know why he wouldn't kill King Saul? You know why he didn't say anything negative about King Saul? Because he said, God forbid that I should touch God's anointed. You see, you and I as true, authentic, genuine believers, as children of the Most High God, have the shield of God around us. We have the favor of God like a shield that surrounds us. You see, he's controlling those walls of water. He's holding back those colossal walls from collapsing on you. Remember the three Hebrew children? I love that story, don't you? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Boy, those are some names, aren't they? Three of them were thrown in the fire, but guess what? There was a fourth man in that fire with them. That was the Son of God. Friends, they didn't burn, did they? You couldn't smell the smoke on their clothes. Not a hair or their clothing was singed. The only thing that was burned off of them was those bonds that bound their feet and hands and those people who threw them into that fiery furnace. Man, they were walking in that fiery furnace fireproof. (laughs) They were walking in there with freedom. They were being liberated, emancipated from all those things and people that were holding them back for most of their lives. Remember, they were captives In a land called Babylon. I guess walking in that fire was a scary thing. Wouldn't you be a little afraid? It wasn't an enjoyable thing to be in a furnace. It didn't seem fair. They didn't know whether they would survive or not. Remember, they told King Nebuchadnezzar that if God spares us or not, We will not bow down to your golden image. They didn't know if they were going to survive. But my friends, what God was doing in that fire is he was getting rid of everything that restrained them and restrict them from becoming all that God wanted them to become. Think about it. Their enemies that threw them in there, they were consumed by the fire. And guess what King Nebuchadnezzar did and all the other people? They started worshiping the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even God changed the heart and minds of their enemies. Even God got them favor with those that once opposed them. They had the favor of God on them. And it was obvious to all because of what they went through. See the storms of life, the sea bottoms of life that you and I are going to have to go through, it may not be all about you necessarily. It's about God getting rid of those things that are holding you back so he can position you so that you can fulfill your God-given identity and ministry and destiny for his kingdom. You know, I believe that's why the Bible teaches not to be intimidated by our enemies. You don't have to be intimidated by those that come against you. Do you realize that? You know why? Because if God doesn't remove those enemies, you know what what he's going to do? He's going to change their mind about you. And those that were once against you are going to suddenly be for you. And if God doesn't change their mind, he's going to use what they say and what they do to your advantage and in your favor. What am I saying? God has this. Aren't you glad to know that God has your back? God's sovereign. What does it mean by sovereign? He's in control of every event 
every person, every place, everything, every situation, every circumstance of your life. And guess what? He can even use those that are against you to help you to succeed. The most unlikely people. How many of you ever read the book of Ezra? Wonderful book. You need to read it. I know it's probably not the most popular book in the Bible. But God gives us a picture of this man by the name of Zerubbabel. Have you ever heard of Zerubbabel? Oh, man, I'm going to enlighten you today, all right? I like to teach you new things. Zerubbabel was used of God to rebuild the temple. You see, there was a Persian king that had taken over the Babylonian Empire. And that Persian king made a royal decree that Zerubbabel and his people could return to Jerusalem and build the temple back on the Temple Mount. So the construction began. Everything was going great. The foundations were laid. The altar was built. I mean, everything was going as planned. And matter of fact, I had a plan. But guess what? Satan always raises his ugly head when things are going well for the kingdom. And here opposition comes up. They have some people that are jealous and envious of that leader called Zerubbabel. And they want to try to get rid of him. So what do they do? They, they uh, give money to the people. They bribe the workers to cause trouble. And all of a sudden, they're stirring up all kinds of turmoil and commotion. When all that was happening, Zerubbabel could have said, God, I'm doing what you asked me to do. Why am I having all this opposition? God, why are all these most powerful, influential people surrounding me at odds against me? God, I know you've called me to do this. God, I know I have your favor upon this ministry. Your callings are irrevocable. But why is this opposition seeming to get the best of me? Later on in the book, we find out that those people who opposed the rubble ball had sent a letter to the present-day king of Persia. And they were lying about the rubble ball. They were making accusations that were not true about this leader. And what happened is that they basically told the Persian royalty that what Zerubbabel was doing was he was rebuilding the city. He was going to create a city-state and he was going to overthrow the Persians and stop paying taxes. And it was a bad idea to let them continue with the reconstruction program. Well, that king of Persia sent for Zerubbabel and asked Zerubbabel who gave him permission to rebuild the temple. And if you will read Ezra, the book of Ezra, Zerubbabel goes into a speech talking about how that they are the people of the Most High God and how that there was a great Israelite king by the name of King Solomon who built a magnificent temple to worship God. And because of the rebellion of the people of Israel, God brought judgment upon them and the Persians, I'm sorry, and the Babylonians came and destroyed and demolished not only the city but leveled the temple. But suddenly the Persian empire overtook the Babylonians. And in the first year of that reigning king of Persia by the name of Cyrus, he made a royal decree that the temple would be rebuilt. Now here's where it really gets exciting. This present-day Persian king goes and looks throughout the archives, the royal archives. He finds in the first year of kings of Persia, Cyrus, there was a royal decree made that the temple could be rebuilt. You know what that Persian king did? He brought all those people that opposed the rubble in. And he says, you're not going to resist it. In fact, I'm going to make a royal decree here. The entire reconstruction project will be paid by the Persian royal treasuries. And then he looks at those that oppose the rubble and says, and guess who's going to give him food and supplies? You are. <laughs> Do you see how God changes and turns the tables? You see, they meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. See, you may have people or situations that are trying to stop you. And you know what I found out about God? You don't have to fight your own battles. He knows how to make that all backfire. And it is utterly amazing to sit back and watch God in the action. Remember, 
those people that tried to hurt and hinder and hamper Zerubbabel were now the people that was helping Zerubbabel. Wow. If Zerubbabel wouldn't have had all that opposition, he would not have had the entire reconstruction project paid by the Persian government. And all the food and supplies free of charge. Remember Psalms 23? Oh, that popular f- verse that goes, Yea, thou walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff shall comfort me. Those verses are, are, are comfort to us. But don't forget the, the other verse that comes after that. And God will prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. My God knows how to turn the table And then he knows how to prepare the table for his chosen, called ones. Amen? Wow. You don't have to vindicate yourself. God will do the vindication. Just stay in faith. There may be people that are trying to stop you or hinder you from doing what God has called you to do. They may be stirring up trouble and turmoil and chaos and commotion. But if you'll stay in faith and be at peace, God knows how to make all that backfire. You know, in Psalms 141, verse 10, I don't know if we have that on the overhead, maybe not, but don't worry about it. Let me tell you what God says to the people of Israel. God says, the enemies that have laid the trap for you to fall into will fall into their own traps. God knows how to vindicate you. You don't have to say a word. You don't have to put on a front of defense. God knows how to vindicate you. And those setbacks in time will become divine setups for God to take you where you need to go and to help you accomplish what he's called you to accomplish in life. And all of God's people said, amen and amen to that. When you face things that you don't understand, difficult challenges, when things do not look fair, When you look like you're getting the bottom, (laughs) I'm sorry, when you look like you're getting the short end of the stick and you've hit rock bottom, I want you to know that God is on your side. If God be for you, who can be against you? And just because you're in a situation that doesn't look fair and you don't understand it and it's a difficulty, doesn't mean that God has forgotten about you or somehow you've lost his favor. I promise you this. Based on the word of God, if you and I will stay in faith and be faithful to what God has called us to do, those setbacks that you have in your life, God is going to divinely orchestrate as a divine setup for your life. And it's going to become a part of what God uses to take you to a whole new level in life. Some of the things that are frustrating you, Uh, Some of those closed doors, some of those seeming missed opportunities, some of those disappointments, some of those uh, so-called failures and fiascos that all of us have had in life, God in his sovereign divine intervention is going to use them somehow to promote us and to help us to reach our fullness for him. That opposition, that obstruction, that adversity... When God brings his divine intervention, you're going to see how it's all going to work for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. You know, you and I, and I'm talking to me just as much as I am you because sometimes I get that stinking thinking. Amen? I had some stinking thinking last night. Can you believe that? My wife and the Holy Spirit had to straighten me out last night. We all get stinking thinking, but, but you and I need to get a right perspective and realize that we don't have to be afraid or worried or fearful when we're between two colossal walls that seem to be pressing against us. Because if you're a child of God, one thing is a fact. You got the favor of God behind you. The favor of God is going to hold back those colossal walls of water. The favor of God is going to keep those walls of opposition from crushing you and collapsing on you. That demonic entity, that enemy that's in hot pursuit of you, the favor of God will keep them from defeating you. Amen? See, they meant it for harm. But God's going to turn around 
for your good. See, he's in the process of doing something. He's in the process of taking some of you from the bottom to the mountaintops. If you'll stay in faith, if you'll stay confident in the Lord, although you may be in a bottom place in your life, like Zerubbabel, you're going to see what God has been doing behind the scenes one day. All those that were against you are going to suddenly be for you. Those problems are going to turn around, amen? Unexpected blessing is going to come your way. There's going to be spiritual breakthroughs, divine interventions, validations, vindications, restorations, reconciliations, and powerful movements of God in our life. We're going to be like the children of Israel. We're going to leave the bottom to the mountaintop of victory. I want to be one of those people. How about you? Let's all stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you're here today and, and you're at a bottom place in your life. You don't think it could get any worse. Oh, you're, you're passing through it, but you're intimidated by those colossal walls of water. Uh, you're, you're, you're worried about what could happen. What if they collapse on me? What if this thing comes crushing down upon me? What if my enemies finally overtake me? What if I don't make it through in time? What about my family? What about my little ones? What about my livelihood? What about my reputation? Maybe you are worried. You're full of anxiety. You're overwhelmed with your problems and you're not anticipating anything good to happen. Oh my friends, if I'm talking to somebody out there like you, won't you come forward? Won't you get on your knees before God and say, God, I'm afraid. God, I don't like this place I'm in. God, I'm at the rock bottom and I'm about ready to just give up and throw up my hands. It may be loud. It may be full of turmoil. It may have, you may have a lot of commotion in your life or disturbance in your life. But let me tell you something about God. He can give you peace in the midst of the storm. And he can get you through. When you come through, you're going to be refined. You're going to find out that God has gotten rid of all those things that were holding you back all your life. And you're going to cross over on dry ground. And you're going to come out on the other side. And you're going to be able to do what God has called you to do. Be what God has called you to be. And to accomplish what God has called you to accomplish. Maybe you're here today and and you're discouraged, and you're down and out, and you're at rock bottom, and you need to come and pray that God will give you the stamina, the confidence, the courage you need. Maybe you're here today, and you don't know Christ as your Savior and Lord. Why you feel so down and lost and disoriented in life is because you don't know the Lord. If that's the case, I can lead us in prayer, and we can pray together, and you can accept Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Just say a prayer like this and mean it from your heart. Well, dear Lord Jesus, I'm lost. Without you, I have no hope. I'm a sinner in desperate need of a Savior. I turn from my sins to you. I place my faith in you alone to save me. And I totally surrender all my life to the Lordship of Christ. God, I let go and I let God take control. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me a new life. Thank you for giving me a life of victory and abundance. A life that is eternal. A life that one day I'll rule and reign with you forever. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time in a minute, Christ came into your heart. And you don't need to be ashamed of him. He wasn't ashamed of you. He died in humiliation and shame publicly for you. If you were the only one here on earth, Christ would have died for you. Because of that very fact, if you've prayed that prayer a minute from your heart, you need to come down here today and make Christ public to all. Maybe you need to follow the Lord and believers' baptism, like Jennifer did today. Maybe you need to reconnect with God. You've drifted away from God. You don't have the passions or the priorities and pursuits that you used to have for the kingdom of God. Maybe you need a real good rededication. Whatever it is, will you come? Will you experience the God, not only of the mountaintops, but of the bottom of the seas?